your glory, our supreme concern. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. In uh, 1878, a, a guidebook, Edinburgh Picturesque Notes, written by Robert Louis Stevenson, was published. And it contained his personal reflections on the city, Edinburgh, uh, of his birth. And in this book, he tells the story of two unmarried sisters who shared a single room. However, as staunch churchgoers, they had a falling out over a theological matter. And such was the bitterness of the fallout that they never spoke a word again to each other. But for the fear of the scandal that this breakdown in relationship might bring upon them, they continued to live in this same room together and they drew a, a chalk line across the floor to separate their two living spaces. And it allowed each one to come and go without violating the other sister's domain. And this, sadly, was how they spent the rest of their miserable lives, coexisting in this hateful silence. And the reason for this enduring misery, well, each sister was too proud to say, to the other. Please forgive me. C.S. Lewis put it aptly when he famously said, everyone says that forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive. And so we, we come this morning to the second half of the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. We thought about last week, and forgive us our debts, and now we come to, as we also have forgiven our debtors. It's one thing to confess our sins to the God we cannot see. It's quite another to forgive the sins against us of the people we can see. But this is the, the premise of Jesus. Confession of our sins to God runs parallel with our forgiving the sins of others against us. And Jesus amplified this assumption by stating immediately after concluding the Lord's Prayer, these verses. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, um, the first half of the, the, the first uh, of this fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer is relatively easy to expound and forgive us our debts. And we saw last week that what bread is to the body, forgiveness is to the soul. If bread is fundamental to the sustenance of life, forgiveness is fundamental to the spiritual life. And regular confession of sin is really vital for our walk with God. It keeps fresh the joy of our salvation. And when we get some sort of handle on the enormity of our sin and the, the very great cost of our redemption from the wages of sin, well, the, the joy of our salvation stays living. So this is where the, the regular confession of sin plays such an important role. And like the Puritans did, we should keep short accounts of our sin with our creator and our predator, the invisible God whom the Lord Jesus is the image. But this second half of the petition, as we also have forgiven our debtors, is less easy to expound. And particularly these two verses of amplification, verses 14 and 15. So firstly, I would like to try and what I've called unravel the, the puzzle of the petition. What did Jesus mean when he said, as we also have forgiven our debtors? Are verses 14 and 15 a contradiction of the doctrine of justification by faith? The Christian's forgiveness of others would appear to be a, a precondition to God's 
forgiveness of the Christian. To, to put it another way, does the Christian earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others? Is forgiving others a good work that merits God's forgiveness of the Christian's own sins? What Jesus teaches here in, in verses 14 and 15 seems to, to clash with Paul's teaching on justification through the grace of God, access by faith. And of course we know these familiar words that Paul emphatically writes to the Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. To the Galatians, Paul writes, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So Paul is, is, is dogmatic. There is no deed the Christian can do to justify himself. There is no pathway to justification through the observance of God's moral law. No, salvation is through grace. It's a gift. It's access by faith. And Jesus himself emphasised the centrality of faith in salvation. At Simon the Pharisee's home, he said to the woman with a shameful reputation who had anointed his feet with an alabaster jar of perfume, your faith has saved you. And Jesus did not link God's forgiveness of this woman's many sins with her forgiving others. This woman knew she deserved nothing but God's condemnation. The, the religious and respectable society had already frozen her out from polite society. But Jesus, the friend of sinners, had offered her God's forgiveness, which she received by faith, and demonstrated that faith by this costly act of devotion. So that the gospel of grace is inviolable. It's sacrosanct. What Jesus teaches here in verses 14 and 15 cannot contradict it. What Jesus teaches, therefore, about the Christian's obligation to forgive others has to be held in tension with the wider New Testament doctrine of grace. But there's another puzzle arising from Jesus' words in verses 14 and 15. Should the Christian's forgiveness of others be unconditional? Is there such a thing as a doctrine of unconditional forgiveness? Is Jesus teaching Christians should forgive others unconditionally? Now, I have to be perfectly honest, some eminent Christian leaders believe so. On Thursday afternoon, I was in my, one of my favourite shops, the second-hand Christian bookshop run by um, Book Aid in Lower Sydney, and I picked up there a copy of R.T. Kendall's Total Forgiveness. Now, who am I? <laughs> to disagree with the former pastor of uh, Westminster Chapel and an internationally renowned Bible teacher. But I do find myself disagreeing with him. And he writes this, there must be total forgiveness even when there is not a res restoration of relationship. One must totally forgive those who will not be reconciled. And R.T. Kendall infers that there must be forgiveness even if forgiveness is not sought, even if contrition is not shown, even if penitence is not expressed, and even if repentance is not demonstrated. But is that really biblical? Is unconditional forgiveness a biblical doctrine? Does it stand up to, to biblical scrutiny in both the Old and New Testaments? I think not. The consistent biblical principle is this. God always links forgiveness of his people with their repentance. There was a, a period of sustained spiritual decline in Israel and national humiliation at the hands of their enemies during the, the office of the last judge of Israel, Samuel. And we read this in 1 Samuel 7. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, 
If you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Asheroths and commit yourself to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and their Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. And the result? Well, there was the restoration of the covenant relationship with Israel. The Lord's hand was with the Israelites in battle, the Philistines were subdued, and the land which had been under Philistine control was restored to Israel. Through the prophet Jeremiah, Yahweh, the, the God of Israel, declared this, If you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. Through the prophet Malachi, right at the very end of the Old Testament era, the Lord says this, Return to me, and I will return to you. Not once in the Old Testament, writes Brian Edwards in his book, Grace, Amazing Grace, did God ever forgive without first demanding repentance? And Jesus did precisely the same in the New Testament. And speaking to his disciples, he said this, If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Look how forgiveness is inextricably linked with repentance in Matthew 18, as Tim read to us. A brother who refuses to listen to the brother he has sinned against, who refuses to listen to two other brothers, and who refuses to listen to the assembled church, is to be excommunicated, put out of the church, and treated as if he were an unbeliever. That is hardly unconditional forgiveness. Following the practice of unconditional forgiveness would render church discipline useless. If the church simply forgives the church member guilty of serious immorality without their repentance and without their penitence, God's holy standard for his people would be whole under the waterline. If the local church tolerates immorality in its midst, it loses its Christian distinctiveness and becomes just like the world. So it cannot be that Jesus has in mind here, in verses 14 and 15, unconditional forgiveness. His very first sermon, recorded in Mark 1, linked entry into the kingdom of God, not only with belief in the gospel, but with repentance. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So verses 14 and 15 have to be interpreted in the wider context of what the Bible teaches. Yes, Jesus places a heavy weight of obligation on the Christian to forgive others, but without compromising the integrity of the gospel of grace. But forgiveness is never unconditional. It is always attached to repentance. There are these three. Repentance, forgiveness and reconciliation. And the sequence is critical. Without repentance, there can be no forgiveness. And without forgiveness, there can be no reconciliation. So then, secondly, what is the point of the petition? There is the obligation to forgive others but not under all circumstances and never unconditionally. So what's the point that Jesus is making? In view of these caveats, what is Jesus driving at here in verses 14 and 15? Well, I believe it's this. Christians must have a forgiving spirit. Their default position is to forgive. Their disposition is to forgive. They are always minded to forgive whenever possible. And their watchword is Proverbs 10 verse 12. Hatred stirs up a conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. And they try to follow the Apostle Peter's admonition. Above all, 
love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. You know, the kind of sins that love covers, overlooks and, and forgives, are the everyday, relatively trivial ones. It's the person who always talks over you when you're speaking. It's the friend who is habitually late. It's the Christian brother who sometimes lacks grace when he speaks to you. It's the one who forgets to honour an undertaking he made to you. It's the Christian sister who does not return what she has borrowed from you. They are not grievous sins, but they are galling sins. They are the relatively minor offences we do well to let love cover over, not to hang on to and to put out of our minds. And that's what we need a forgiving spirit for. The forgiving spirit is evidence that we ourselves have been forgiven. The grace we ourselves have received from God is displayed by the grace we pass on to others. And it is the grace which is the glue holding churches together. The forgiving spirit which is willing to overlook the failings of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul writes this to the Ephesians. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. But there are other occasions when Christians must always display a willingness to forgive, but the seriousness of the offence necessitates real con contrition and repentance from the offender. And when a genuine apology is forthcoming, Christians must always be ready to forgive, forget and move on. But even when the, the offender is truly penitent, we know, don't we, from personal experience, it's not always easy to forgive when you have been badly hurt. It's hard to let go of the resentment you feel towards the person who has hurt you. I once heard a story of a man who was dying and he called an old adversary to come and see him before he died. And the man said to this long-standing enemy, I want to forgive you for all the wrong that you've done to me over the years. But then he rather destroyed the, the olive branch that he had held out by adding, but remember, if I rise from this deathbed, the old animosity still stands between us. How easy it is to, to harbour the, the injuries others have inflicted on us in our minds. Grudges can become the most treasured of our possessions. We almost take pride in the fact that we hold on to them. How hard it is to let them go. But release them, says Jesus, we must, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Sinclair Ferguson writes these very sobering words of challenge to the Christian who is reluctant to forgive. The man who mouths the words, forgive us our debts, but will not forgive others their debts, has not begun to understand the weight of his own sin. But once our eyes have been opened by grace to the enormity of our own sin, it puts into some kind of perspective the sin of others towards us. Genuinely feeling the weight of our own sin, but at the same time the joy of forgiveness, well, it becomes easier to forgive our debtors. But what is the point of this petition, as we also have forgiven our debtors, on those occasions, on those occasions when pardon is not sought and the offender is unconcerned about reconciliation. The offence is not a, a trifling matter, it's a serious one. Penitence and repentance are necessary for us to forgive, but they're not forthcoming. Does this give us a license to be bitter? Are we, are we justified in, in building up, restoring up re resentment towards the one who is not in the least con a bit contrite? The lack of contrition makes more intense, doesn't it, the, 
the pain of the offence. In July 2020, three young men were given long prison sentences for the manslaughter of PC Andrew Harper. And observers at the trial were shocked to see the three laughing and joking during the proceedings. They didn't take seriously the, the scale of their crime or the pain it had caused PC Harper's family. And when pronouncing sentence, the judge said that they had shown absolutely no remorse whatsoever. They were not the least bit interested in being forgiven by PC Harper's loved ones. Now, the, the policeman's family, we might think, would be fully justified in feeling bitterness towards the three. But Jesus had something else in mind for his followers. If forgiveness was inappropriate, as no forgiveness had been sought and no penitence expressed, Jesus had another quality in mind to replace it. And remarkably, it was mercy. The Christian might not be able to forgive his enemy. Actually, nowhere does Jesus teach, forgive your enemies. But he can show him mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, announced Jesus at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who hate you. The point of the petition, as we also have forgiven our debtors in these circumstances, is not to extend forgiveness, but mercy to those who have maliciously hurt us. Not forgiveness, but mercy. It's praying for the offender that he or she might come to see the gravity of their offence and seek your, or more importantly, God's forgiveness. The puzzle of the petition, the point of the petition under different circumstances. Well, let's think briefly, just to conclude with, the pra practicalities of the petition. How can we practically apply the petition as we have also forgiven our debtors? Well, I've got three suggestions. Firstly, avoid bitterness at all costs. Yitzhak Zuckerman was a, was a hero of the Jewish resistance to the Nazis in World War II. And he was one of the very few survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And after the war, Zuckerman was lauded for his heroism. But it gave him, actually, little comfort. He began drinking, and he suffered great mental anguish. And he said in one interview, if you could lick my heart, it would poison you. If you could lick my heart, it would poison you. And bitterness is so poisonous, isn't it? It's so corrosive. And it corrodes us from within. And it makes the thorns of our pain so much sharper as they press into us. Pray, pray, pray to God to help you in your daily battle against bitterness to those who have grievously sinned against you. Avoid bitterness at all costs. But secondly, forgiving someone is not the same as trusting them. If someone has let you down badly, has betrayed your trust, but seeks your forgiveness, you are obliged to forgive him or her from your heart. But forgiveness does not run parallel with wholly trusting that person again. You, you might be able to trust him or her again, you might not be able to. Someone cannot demand trust once it has been lost. Trust, once it has been severely undermined, is very difficult to regain. Sometimes you forgive, but you cannot quite bring yourself to trust. And you might feel self-critical about this. You might feel guilty and doubt yourself. Have I really forgiven this person? I still don't trust him. He might stab me in the back again. And those doubts linger. However, forgiveness and trust are not inseparable. You can genuinely forgive someone, but not really bring yourself to trust them 
You shouldn't feel guilty about that because trust has to be earned and it can't be evoked at the click of your fingers. Lastly, if you are the offender, if you're the offender, make your apology clear and unambiguous. How often do you hear it said by someone who has been sinned against, with a, say this with a, this sort of thing with a sigh? I think he apologised to me in his own sort of way. I think she was sorry, although she didn't say she explicitly was sorry. There's an old song, isn't there, from the 1970s. Sorry seems to be the hardest word. And it is so true, isn't it? We are proud. We don't like to come right out and admit that we were at fault. We realise we were wrong, but we say it to the person we have wronged in a sort of a, a roundabout way. We, we drape the apology in ambiguity. We're clear, we're not clear for fear of losing face. If you are in the wrong, if you have let someone down badly, if you have hurt someone unkindly, apologise clearly and contritely. Leave that person in no doubt. No, you are sincerely sorry. Don't leave them thinking, was that an apology or not? And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. The puzzle of the petition. We have to interpret the petition and verses 14 and 15 in the light of all scripture to understand that they don't contradict the gospel of free grace, but they have to be held in tension with it. Forgiveness is never unconditional. God always attaches repentance to forgiveness, and so should the Christian. The point of the petition is to foster a, a, a forgiving spirit, to exhibit a, a readiness to forgive right, relatively minor transgressions against us, and the more serious ones when repentance is expressed. If someone refuses to repent and isn't interested in reconciliation, biblically speaking, there is no basis for forgiveness. But at the same time, that is no warrant for bitterness. Instead, Jesus gives us a mandate for mercy. Pray for the one who has sinned against you. Pray for his spiritual welfare and that he might be convicted by his sin. And then lastly, the, there are these practicalities of the petition. Don't yield an inch to bitterness, otherwise it will demand a mile. Forgive the penitent, realising that you may not always be able to fully trust them again. And if you're the offender and have caused hurt, apologise clearly and contritely. One of the, the most powerful stories of forgiveness is, uh, is found in the, the very last chapter of Genesis, chapter 50. And Joseph's brothers, after their father Jacob's death, throw themselves down at Joseph's feet and ask for his forgiveness for selling them for selling him into slavery and lying to their father that he was dead. And Joseph, with no hint of bitterness, replies, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And that's the power of forgiveness. It can bring many lives back from the brink. So writes Paul, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you.